Well, good morning, everyone. We're, uh, we have actually three things I'd like to go over today, so I hope that won't be too confusing. Uh, maybe we should start with the most recent event, which is that uh, I went to the talk yesterday, after all, with the people from Belin and Hebron. Uh, and I, frankly, I was thrilled. I was, I was really inspired. And I know, were you there, Amy? Yeah. Okay. I figured you probably were. I never see you, but you're always there. <laughs> <laughs> so I would actually like to say a couple of words about what I found was so good about it. And then call on you and you know, if it's just a remark or two, just stay where you are. But if you'd like to say more, uh, come on up here. We'll strap the high tech on you and, and you can hold forth again. But uh, essentially it was someone from Hebron where there is a very small uh, Jewish settler enclave surrounded by a very large uh, Palestinian population. And whenever this happens, you need to secure the settlers. So you have roads that come in that cut the, the uh, Palestinian hab uh, habitations apart. And then you, the roads have to be patrolled and then the whole thing gets started. The whole, you know, the occupation disaster gets started. Now Hebron is actually – well, first of all, it's a place that's had a lot of emotional meaning for both camps. And that's one of the problems that you both, both the, the uh, Arabs and the Jews feel that it's part of their heritage. So it's really seriously contested. I think it's – very comparable to Kosovo. So both the Albanians who feel that they've descended from the original Illyrian people and they've been there for 2,000 years. And then the Serbs who lost a battle there in the 13th century and have never forgotten it. Um, it's so Hebron uh, – Palestine in general, but Hebron in particular has that kind of double valence and it's just been brutally difficult to tease them apart. And <coughs> There's a lot of n international presence in Hebron, which ex I should incidentally tell you the other two things I do want to talk about today. I want to get back to what we heard on Tuesday about, third, about uh, nonviolent peace force and third party nonviolent intervention. Say a little bit more about that because I think it's a big topic uh, for the future of nonviolence. And thirdly and finally, assuming we get through those two things, talk a little bit about restorative justice, which is rather – different in, in the approach that comes – that uses. Uh, let's see. Had a yeah. If you could pass this, – this is irrelevant to almost everything else. But if you could pass this back to Zoe, I want – uh, Jenna and Zoe should see this cartoon. Okay. And that was a word from our sponsor. Now we're back to our topic. So in Belin, it's a little bit different because that town is trying to be the second place where the separation wall that's being built uh, roughly but not exactly along the green line that's nom notionally dividing a, a future state of Palestine from uh, Israel. But the wall actually takes in a lot of Palestinian property and in some cases cuts farmers off from their livelihood. And that is the case in Bilin. The plan there, the, if that wall goes as it was planned, it will separate farmers from their olive orchards. And that means – to use the terms of Ted Gore that I've mentioned from time to time, it would be pushing people from poverty to destitution. Okay? So when you move – when you're pushed into destitution, you really have nothing to lose anymore. And in a way, it's a similar dynamic to the paradox of repression. In fact, why similar? I would say it's an example of the paradox of repression. If you deliberately push people from poverty, which they can stand for a long time, really an appallingly long time, into destitution where they can't live, then they respond with, non with resistance of one kind or another. Either they leave the territory or they fight you in some way or another. And as we know, what we're all about here is what way you're going to choose to fight with. And in your reader, you have two or three articles 
on uh, Tabasco in Mexico because that was a classic example. Pemex came into that state and which was basically agricultural and fishing and uh, polluted the, the land so badly that it was impossible to make a living anymore. People's children were uh, being born with deformities and dying at an early age because of all of the uh, chemicals, petrochemicals in the water and in the soil. And so they decided to be kind of a buffer between the state of Chiapas, which was below them, and which at that time was responding with the EZLN with, with violence. They were going to be in between Chiapas and the, the uh, federal government with a nonviolent resistance. And it didn't last very long, but it got some things accomplished. And it was really pretty darn good uh, as nonviolence uh, while it lasted. So you have a few articles on that. Now, the sep building of the separation wall has been an issue where the Palestinians have decided to actually try to obstruct the progress of the wall. And in the town of Budrus, the village of Budrus, they were able to get the wall shifted. And whenever there's a success in a population that's trying to do things nonviolently, that tends to be very exciting and people pick up on it and it can spread. And so this is what the people in Bilin are trying to do. And I'm really sorry now that I've heard from them. I'm sorry they weren't able to come to this class with their pictures and whatnot, but we'll do the best they can. <coughs> How to begin? They, I think a lot of Palestinians feel, they have learned from experience that nonviolent resistance is not going to get them anywhere. So this is a, a pretty good way to start nonviolent resistance. What, what did I say? Did I say violent resistance is not going to get them anywhere? That's what I meant to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> if that were true, then we'd just, you know, shut down the cameras, leave, and just <laughs> the whole thing would be over. No. Uh, totally wrong. Violent resistance is not going to get them anywhere. <coughs> and uh, they, they tried a pretty widespread nonviolent resistance in the first intifada in uh, 87 to 89, which you saw a little bit about in the film of where there is hatred. And we didn't really get to talk about it very much, but I think the drive of that nonviolent resistance, intifada one, resulted in the Madrid peace accords. And at that point, unfortunately, the resistors felt, okay, we've done our job so we can go back to same old, same old. And who, you know, who can blame them? When existence is hanging by a thread anyway, you barely have enough to eat to take off from work and go and be nonviolent for a long time. It's, it's, you know, it's very, very difficult. Which is why, as David Hartzell was telling us on Tuesday, we pay uh, field team workers in nonviolent peace force. So but anyway, it was a case of nonviolence that was working, but in the end, when the nonviolent resistors were able to sort of shift the momentum up to the decision makers, okay, we fixed it on the ground, now you, you know, do you do the changes, it failed. And this is an interesting kind of dynamic to consider. When Martin Luther King did this repeatedly, I would say it was more successful. You know, f one f iconic episode for me is when he asked President Lyndon Johnson for a Voters' Rights Act and Johnson said, that's impossible. I haven't got the, moment, the, uh, the support for that. In Congress, we would lose everything. He said, okay, I know what to do. Went out and had a one more year of demonstrations and organizing and uh, resistance in the streets. And then he came back and Johnson signed this, the Voters' Rights Act and handed Martin Luther King Jr. the pen and sang – this is Johnson singing, I don't know how good he was – sang, We Shall Overcome. And many of his coworkers said they had never seen Martin Luther King Jr. cry until that moment. Were, that was an example of getting the dynamic to work. The change has to start from the grassroots, but you force the power holders, the official power holders, their kind of power, to respond. And okay, finito la musica, story's over, it was a success. 
But in at least two big cases that I can think of, people on the ground did their work, handed it over to the power holders or the official power holders, and they blew it. And one was the first intifada where the international community could not get an agreement together that would actually work. And the other uh, was this uh, Prague Spring uprising of 1968 where the Czechs and their leadership were very much on the same page, very much together. And it was them against the Warsaw Pact armies. They were using police cars to deliver contraband newspapers. It was, it was working very well. But then the Soviets invited, quote unquote, about nine people from the Czech leadership to Moscow for talks, quote unquote. Uh, I, I'm glad I was not a fly on the wall when those talks were going on. It must have been really brutal jawboning. And they got the leadership basically, I mean, to not to put too fine a point on it, got them to betray the revolution. And they, they knew that they had done that. They went back and had to announce this to the people. They were crying. It was a disaster. Well, at that point, the, what could, could have happened, I guess that's the word I want to use. What could have happened is the people could have said, okay, back to the streets. You know, how, much, how much more do you want? We've done it for uh, nine months. We'll give you another nine months till we, can, till we get – when the people lead, the leaders will follow. But the leaders weren't following, so you have to go back and do it some more. Obviously, you can get exhausted doing stuff like this. You don't want to risk your life. Some people were hurt. Some people were killed. Uh, everything was disrupted. It can be exhausting. But I think that really at the bottom of it, what makes these dynamics fail is we still can't get over the idea that we're in charge. We still think that the President of the United States is the chief executive and he will do everything in his power to get you to keep on thinking that. You know, he'll say, I'm the decider. And everybody goes back to work to go, thank God. We've got a decider up there making wrong decisions on our behalf. Um, so it really is part of – I'm seeing again that it's part of this very big paradigm shift to get people to realize that the human individual is where all of this is coming from. And human individuals create structures and they can dissipate those structures overnight. You know, one, one day – once when I was very – getting kind of depressed and I thought we weren't going to be able to k pull off the revolution. I'm glad I didn't realize that I was right <laughs> at that time. But, uh, I didn't realize how long it would take. Um, I remember talking to a socialist friend of mine. It was unusual to have an actual, honest-to-gosh, red-blooded socialist. But he, Hal Draper was one. And I was saying to him, it's such an enormous monolithic thing. How are we going to get anywhere? And he said, look, uh, up until one day, Joseph Stalin was God. On the next day, he didn't even exist. People decided uh, he was a non-person. All the statues were pulled down. All the textbooks were erased and he just wasn't there anymore. So we have to have the faith that it's us and our decisions that we renew every day that are really building the world and the rest of it are just uh, agreements. Agreements that are made and that can be broken. Uh, even – okay. I was going to say some unpatriotic things. I think I better stop here. So um, the first intifada, as I say, was really a success. It was going along pretty well. I think we, we may even want to put Kosovo in this category that the, in 1991 90, it actually had forced the Serbs to reopen the University of Pristina and allow people to uh, teach in Albanian. And it's remarkable how often that is the issue in these identity struggles, getting to have instruction in your own language. Uh, I would say second to water rights <laughs> is the most important issue today. Um, but the people didn't really quite appreciate that they had succeeded. And so at a famous funeral celebration in Drenica, somebody showed up with a mask and a rifle and said, we're the KLA and this is how it has to go. And the 
the nonviolence more or less collapsed and the energy drained off into the KLA. The next thing you knew, you had 78 days of NATO bombing to get the Serbs off their back. So it's a kind of balance, isn't it, where on the one hand you have to acknowledge that you had a success. On the other hand, very important not to try to own that success personally, not to say I did it, and above all, not to be, you know, I'm going to coin a word here. It's not a very pretty one, so we don't have to end up continuing to use it, but not to be triumphalistic about it. <laughs> like when you, uh, when you win the 100 yards dash, you're supposed to spray champagne over everybody, which is very pagan sacrificial holdover. I don't think they realize that. It's real superstition. Um, but you know, you're supposed to dance around. Even if you like get 10 yards, there's a special dance you're supposed to do to show that you've triumphed. And it's extremely important. And Martin Luther King was superb on this point. It's, it's extremely important for nonviolent practitioners not to do that. Uh, let me give you a really good example of how you should do it. And this will concern uh, the Sicilian Gandhi, as he's sometimes called, Danilo Dolci, who was general secretary of the War Resisters League for some years. War Resisters League being a very committed, pacifist, nonviolent organization. It's a nonviolent organization that focuses on war rather than a pacifist organization, which focuses exclusively on war. Maybe it's a fine distinction. It's not going to come up on the midterm. But Danilo Dolce was the general secretary internationally of the War Resisters League. And he was a wealthy architect. Or well, he was an architect, so he was going to become wealthy. And he went down to Sicily one summer for a vacation and was so struck by the poverty there that it changed his whole life. And he dedicated his life to the uplift of these Siciliani, the Sicilian peasants. And uh, – one of his first uh, campaigns was to get a dam built at a town called Giotto. And he really had some struggles to go through because on the one hand, the government didn't want to build that dam. And on the other hand, the mafia didn't want that dam to be built. So throughout his career, he's treading this fine line between the mafiosi on the one hand and the government on the other hand. Mafia government connections usually end up doing a lot of damage. Anyway, not to start singing Woody Guthrie songs and go into all of that. I'm just trying to stay on topic here. After much struggle, particularly against the mafia, he got the dam built, which meant that he now had a lot of water in his possession. And water in Sicily is a valuable commodity. I mean, it's a valuable commodity anywhere where it's rare. I mean, <laughs> fresh water was rare enough in Sicily that this was a huge thing. And uh, now at the whole – this whole time, he's starting schools and he's having – children can come to the school and it does not matter what families they come from. They can be mafiosi or non mafiosi. He's not asking that question. So there's already a bit of a bridge that he's building with the mafia. And on one famous occasion, a mafioso – came to him and said, ecco Danilo. I said, okay Danilo, you've won. Now you get all the water. And Danilo said, no, no, you don't understand. This water is for us. This water is for everybody. Nobody has lost. We just now have done something efficient that's good for Sicily. So that's an excellent example of not being – pardon my neologism. That would be a good television program actually. Pardon my neologism. But anyway, uh, pardon my using the word triumphalistic. It was a good example of not, not doing it. So when you have a, a nonviolent success, you want to come out in between those two extremes. You don't want to say – you don't want to fail to appreciate your, your achievement because that's what's going to give you the energy and the learning capacity to go on to the next go-round. But at the same time, you don't want to gloat and be triumphalistic about it. Okay, so this then by way of <laughs> a long-winded bit of background. I hope you found it amusing. Um, here's the success in Budrus. 
in the remote background, there is some acknowledgement of a success in Bilin. And once again, there are learning institutions which are in business to collect this information and propagate it. And one of them is Holy Land Trust in Bethlehem. And the director of Holy Land Trust is a fellow named Sami Awad. His uncle Mubarak has come and spoken to this class many times. So I just scheduling couldn't make it to work this semester. But I asked uh, Mohammed Khatib if he knew Sami Awad. He, he definitely did. So you have these two kinds of learning going on. There's experiential learning and sort of a folk process where you, you know, who it's there is a mysterious kind of learning process in living systems. Okay? Um, one more digression, we'll be right back on track. In the Rhone Valley, there was a drought, and it lasted for such a long time that five generations of beavers were not able to build their dams. Okay? By the time the sixth generation of beavers came along, there was a good rainfall, the water level rose, and immediately those beavers started building dams. Now, how in tarnation did they know how to do that? You know, their great, 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 great grand beavers <laughs> were the last ones who knew. And uh, to our knowledge, there's no written language in <laughs> beaver community. Uh, it's, it's quite mysterious. So what I'm saying is this process goes on among humans also, not the dam building part, the transmitting of knowledge from one generation to the next. And uh, it will take place, and we don't need to worry about it, except that for our purposes in terms of bringing about a nonviolent revolution and a paradigm shift, it's way too slow, way too slow. So we need institutions that capture that knowledge and codify it, systematize it, and pr propagate it and make it happen more quickly. There used to be such institutions. They were called universities. Now uh, <laughs> they take they large amounts of money from corporations. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, so the people in Berlin, <laughs> here they are. They, they know that uh, there is such a thing as nonviolence. They, uh, they know that it can be made to work. As Muhammad pointed out last night, they, their cause is just. They have a tremendous uh, advantage in that regard. Their cause is completely just. The Israelis are not only violating international law, they're violating their own laws. It was very well pointed out. So you can, you could, it was ripe for civil disobedience. This is classic civil disobedience. You have a law that's not lawful, and you correct it to bring people back to the law. That's really civil. So um, I just want to mention one other thing that really struck me, and then I'd like to call on the rest of you who were there to sort of fill this in. Uh, the thing that struck me maybe most of all was his final announcement. He had shown this very stirring film, this PowerPoint. I was impressed, by the way, he got his – laptop to work. That was pretty impressive. More than I could do. Uh, had this very impressive di uh, display and uh, presentation. And he gave his talk. He answered questions. One of those questions was very impressive, the way he handled that. I'll leave that up to you people. But when it was all over and he had his second standing ovation, he said, there's going to be a conference in Berlin, April 19th through 21st. Something like that. And I just want to add, as you may have noticed, I do not take attendance in this class. <laughs> A word to the wise. Anyway, he said there's going to be this conference and he wants you to come. And he echoed words that I had heard from Mubarak Awad 20 years earlier in Santa Cruz. That we are willing – Mubarak had said we are willing to die, but we do not want to die alone. He said, do please come. And then he said something that really struck me. He said, don't be for us. Don't be against us. Just come and learn. Make your own decision. You see, that, that, is, the, that is really core PNV, the principle of nonviolence. Because remember Gandhi saying, 
if a man or woman truly believes in something, for that person, that thing is right and proper. I mean, the point is always to act on your beliefs and test them. Uh, and sometimes it's the role of the nonviolent actor to help you to do that even when you disagree with him. Remember the famous example of Gandhi coming out of a meeting and there were these black flag people. They wanted to beat him. You know, it wouldn't take much. He only weighs about 104 pounds. He's neither teeth nor hair, the two, two ways that mammals often defend themselves. <laughs> and uh, so they're getting ready to hit him and he says, what good is it going to do you to bang on this head? And they said, hmm, yeah, you know, maybe this isn't exactly the best thing to do. And, and then they said, so what should we do? And then he gave him a whole nonviolent strategy of how they should carry out satyagraha against him. And they kept saying, well, then what if that doesn't work? What should we do next? And finally he said, you should go on a fast unto death against me. <laughs> they said, we're not prepared to do that. He said, that's not my job. You're just trying to tell them how to do it. So that's a humorous but also very real example uh, that uh, he was not trying to recruit people to be on his side. He was just trying to push the truth along. And that's, that's tremendous. Of course, nobody with uh, more than a 52 IQ seeing what's going on on the ground there would fail to realize that this is a very unequal, very imbalanced victim-victimizer situation. Now, you may remember that uh, when David Hartso was here on Tuesday, he briefly mentioned the term nonpartisanship. It's, uh, it's a serious issue in TPNI. I'm not even totally sure he did mention that word. We may have to go back to the webcast, but I think he, I think he is a term. Now, it's taken us uh, – I, I s use the first person plural because this has been a project that I've been working on really for decades. Um, it's taken us really a long time to, to get this concept clear. I think it's pretty clear really throughout the whole community now. People know what they mean by nonpartisanship. The problem was how are you going to go – let's take a village in Nicaragua because I have connections with that country now. Let's say you go into a village in Nicaragua and you, these Contras are coming across the border from Honduras and uh, coming into the village in the middle of the night, rounding people up, shooting men, women, and children. How are you going to be in that situation without feeling that what you're supposed to do is protect those Nicaraguans, not the Contras or Contra as it's usually called even in the plural. So the point is not that you would not protect those people but you would be protecting them because they're people, not because they're Nicaraguans, not because they're victimized. Not because of anything but because you're there to protect human life. And in theory, if the tide were to turn, say if some of those campesinos would grab some of the guns and start shooting back at the Contra, I mean mind you, there'd be a small <laughs> – for one second there, there'd be a rather large thrill of satisfaction. But uh, in reality, as, it's, as a nonviolent person, you would switch affiliations and – not switch affiliation. You have no affiliation. You'd switch over and protect those Contras. Is this realistic? Can it actually happen in practice? Well, I know of one very uh, dramatic case from a um, domestic nonviolent intervention which takes place in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Because every year in the good city of Ann Arbor, the Ku Klux Klan has a rally. And they are not a majority community up there north of the Mason-Dixon. And the good people of Ann Arbor come out and, and some of the bad people of Ann Arbor come out who are bad in every way except they're not racists. And they hate Ku Klux Klan and there's these terrific riots and the police can't even handle it. Well, it so happens that one of the TPNI organizations called Michigan Peace Team is based in Ann Arbor. 
and they do domestic interventions. They are third parties, you see. They're not clan members and they're not anti-clan members. This is a subtle distinction I'm trying to get out here. They're th as professionals, they're in favor of peace. That's what they're in favor of. So they actually come out and do interposition, this real interposition, you know, the last uh, final weapon, ultimate weapon in TPNI between clan members and people who would attack them. And this has worked beautifully and the police have praised them to the skies and said, you know, we would not have been able to control these people without you. And all they are armed with are yellow t-shirts, rather attractive yellow t-shirts that just say Michigan Peace Team on them. Well, on one of these occasions, uh, some of the anti Ku Klux Klan hateful people got out of control, slipped through the line, and were beating a Klan member rather seriously. And this very large African American woman rushed over and threw her body on top of him and protected him from all of these people and then helped him up. So I think that tells the whole story. But it's not the only episode. There was also a case more to the point in, I believe this happened in Hebron, I'm not sure right at the moment, where there was, there was some IDF soldiers in an apartment searching for something and a deranged person came in with a knife and there happened to be a Christian Peacemaker Team member on the scene and he immediately got in the way and held that person, held onto the knife hand until the soldiers could disarm him. Uh, on still a third occasion, because I think it's a really important point and it's, it's good to try to get this in focus. Um, on more than one occasion, Peace Brigades International in Guatemala has been accompanying a group, let's say a group of striking workers in one case that I'm thinking of. And the workers, one of them showed up armed and the rest of the group refused to repudiate that, to tell him to leave or to lay down his weapon and PBI turned around and left. We can't be here. We can't protect you if you have a way of protecting yourself, which is a very different modality. Those of you who are intimately familiar with the Mahabharata, which probably is a small percentage of this community, um, there's a very dramatic scene in that vast epic where the uh, heroine Draupadi, who's now become a kind of figurehead for the entire feminist movement. Draupadi is going to be humiliated in front of a vast crowd. Uh, they're going to be ripping off her sari, her, you know, her dress. And uh, her, she has five husbands. They're all heroes, but they f for it'd be way too long of a story to say they can't intervene. <laughs> so there she is. And She's praying to God for help, save me, save me. And if she's a completely innocent victim, she's going to be humiliated, which is the worst nonviolent point of view, even in a sense, even worse than death. She's praying and praying, and God is apparently not interested. You know, he's, he's got his computer screen turned off, and <coughs> his, his consort, uh, Lakshmi says to him, you know, what kind of a divine incarnation are you? Look, this is one of your best devotees. She's praying to you to, for help and you're not doing it. He, he says, honey, take another look. And she looks down and sure enough, Draupadi is dre desperately holding on to her sari with one hand and praying with the other hand. And at a, a certain point comes where she goes from poverty to destitution in her mind. She says, I'm helpless here. Let's go the other hand and praise and immediately there's an intervention. It's a really cool intervention too because nothing happens but the guy who's pulling her sari off, you know, saris are about six yards long. So he gets to yard six and he gives a yank and, you know, two more yards come off and it's like, so he pulls off about 400 yards of sari and then drops exhausted to the floor. So that, that's how God intervenes. He definitely has a sense of humor. He or she. Uh, now, 
And back to our <laughs> back to our subject, which is <laughs> the the nonpartisan nature of intervention, which Muhammad Khatib referred to, among other things that he was referring to in that brilliant uh, statement of his. So, just to finish up with it, what what we've decided is, uh, and as a community more or less, there's you know, about 20 different organizations. We don't actually meet together. But what we've decided is that we are on the side of peace and justice. And in a case where one side is clearly being victimized, all our behavior will be on behalf of the victim. We'll protect the victim because the victimizer doesn't need protection. But we promise you that the minute the victimizer needs protection, we'll protect him or her. It has nothing to do with who we like or who we don't like. So that's part of what Muhammad was getting at. Hey Michael? Like well. Of course, of course. Uh, if you really know what's happening, if you've taken PAX 164 or some real advantage like that, then you'll know that you're protecting the victimizer from his or her own victimization. And I don't think we've formally mentioned it yet, but there is a wonderful – maybe not wonderful, but there's a very interesting concept in psychology today called uh, perpetrator-induced traumatic stress. And what this is about is the damage that you do to yourself when you harm another person knowingly. It's something that's so serious in its consequences that the United States Army's official position on this is to ignore it. I say if we were to even talk about this, it would put an end to a necessary activity, namely war fighting, which, I did, which they consider necessary. Okay? Perpetration-induced traumatic stress. It's obviously kind of a play on – Traumatic stress syndrome, right? Post-traumatic stress, PTSD. Yeah. Got to get your acronym straight in this business. So the person who has been working on this, uh, her name is Rachel McNair. And she will actually be at the uh, Nonviolent Educators Conference that's taking place on campus in July. Yeah. Mm. Yoga and uh. meditation, and they're trying to incorporate that into the veteran wow. recovery program. So just on a side note, okay. there is a little hope. Thank you, Ashley. They're trying to bring yoga and meditation into uh, recovery programs. That, that I feel good about. If they try and bring it in as training, <laughs> I'm gonna have, we're going to have to talk. But no, that's, for, that's very good. Yeah. No, and, and obviously, one person who was very good at this for Vietnam veterans was Thich Nhat Hanh. He, he developed whole workshops and things uh, to help veterans get over this. But yes, Michael's point is very well taken. You really are not intervening on behalf of one side against the other, even when you interpose yourself or if you don't have to go that far, you do good offices or something to protect a victim. You are, of course, also protecting the victimizer at the same time. Matthias? <laughs> yeah. 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 Wow. Amy, do you have anything to say about that? Excuse me, Amy. Let me repeat Matthias's question because he's asking. This is a beautiful uh, concept in theory, but as Goethe said, "Grau ist alle Theorie." <laughs> theory is nowhere. How are we – given the hatred that we tend to spontaneously feel when we see victimization, what are we actually going to do? Amy. Um, I was just going to say one thing I noticed um, in the video of the demonstration for the uh -huh. um, Sometimes when people were saying to the soldiers that we can make it – Yes, I yes, guess, so I think it's yes. Really cool to them and help yes. them know, you know, you're being a victim too. Yeah, um, yeah. And that helps. But I That's a good point. 
Yeah, in, in any real human community and possibly in any real human individual, there will, you'll get a mix of both. Sometimes you'll be able to keep this beautiful thing in focus and sometimes you won't. So all that we're saying here is to the extent that you can keep it in focus, you'll be effective, be more effective. Actually, the phrase they were using, Amy, is you can refuse too because there's a famous set of Israeli soldiers who are the refuseniks. And actually, last semester we heard from one of those, the you know, high-ranking Air Force officer. So I also caught that and thought that that was terrific. You're not, you're not going to them and saying, you know, you're bad, get out of here. You're saying you can refuse too. And this is a lot of how the, the fraternization works in civilian-based defense. You go to the soldiers and say, you know, I think you've been misled. What are you doing here? You should be joining us. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So what else uh, stood out for you? Marisa, John, Amy, Jenna, others of you who were there last night? What would you like to add? Alex, were you there? I wasn't in the meeting. Okay. Okay. It w I understand it was the same thing. Yeah, that's what I meant. Wonderful. And um, I asked him what he thought was going on with that Russian culture, whether it's kind of a growing force of people attending to Europe and whether he's yeah. going to be able to use it for the right school. Uh -huh. And without a briefing, what he said to me was the fear of Wow. So wow. It really struck me. Yeah. Like yeah. Like yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. And that certainly is the way these uh, social uprisings have gone for the last 20 years. So, uh, so what Alex is saying is she asked Muhammad, is nonviolence going to thrive in Palestine? And without a moment's hesitation, he said, with your help. So there really is – it's interesting because it's a key role that third parties can play and in some cases will make the difference between success and failure. But at the same time, and I think David was stressing this on Tuesday, oh. The minute you go in and do things that they could have done for themselves, you're making a mistake. You're disempowering them instead of empowering them. Yeah, so how to know exactly what to do, how to mobilize their indigenous resources and then step back. So I was very glad one of you was asking on Tuesday, when do you leave? Uh, there's kind of a double problem there. There's a, uh, something that we have kind of tongue in cheek we call peace imperialism where you know if you go in and say hey we've got peace and you don't you need us that will make will tempt you to stick around even after the immediate crisis has been resolved but the other thing that happens and incidentally Matthias we are getting back to your question <laughs> the other thing that happens is when you go and risk your life for other people, a funny thing happens. You fall in love with them. <laughs> and it's very <laughs> difficult to get out. You, you go and discover that these people who are different from you and live in another country and all of this stuff that, uh, that they're your people and you've lived through deeply emotional, you know, border situation tensions with them. It has been actually a real problem in the whole TPNI field. Uh, not only to know strategically when you should leave, but to be able to leave emotionally. It's been difficult because if every team that went into a country ended up staying there, <laughs> there'd be no – where were we going to get this 250,000-person team? to be international and be really third party after that. But back to Matthias' question here. You go into these situations and uh, <coughs> for example, I was over at Rabbi Lerner's house last night. He's going to be coming here talking to us at the end, assuming that his foot heals. He has a very badly sprained ankle. He's going to be talking to us and you know, he, we were both saying that we often don't go to these talks because we're so angry anyway. <laughs> you know, he said, I've got enough anger for seven lifetimes at this point. I don't need to see more scenes of victimization. 
Because when you see them, you lose your nonpartisanship. You lose your sense of the humanity of the other, and that hurts. Uh, it's kind of one of these very awkward things where there's an important question and I don't have the answer to it. I know my, in my own self what I try to do is just remind myself that the victimizer is a victim. I just try to see the humanity in that person and remind myself that I'm trying to help that person get over this mindset of alienation that he or she feels. But we're dealing with very deep stuff and that we need a system, a technique to get these beautiful ideas deeper into our consciousness so that they become part of us. And that's known as PAX 94. <laughs> Meditation, 8 to 9, it's every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. John? Oh, that was the Yeah. 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 Very good point. That was probably the most painful thing that we saw last night that uh, you have these children under the age of 12 being egged on by their parents to throw stones at the Palestinians and curse them and kick them. And there are parental authority figures just standing around not intervening. And parental authority figures and the IDF, you know, the army with all their guns. The uh, Palestinians know full well if they pick up one stone, they'll get shot. But uh, in terms of, I mean, the thing that always hurts me the most is damaging a young person at such a deep level that this is going to go on into the future. But what John is adding to that is, after all is said and done, that IDF soldier is just a grown-up baby who's been taught to hate from childhood. And or, it's, or he's been taught that it's his duty and he's defending the country and he may not like it and all that stuff. Uh, so that's how to maybe deal with it on the idea level. And I think um, when we find ourselves in interpersonal situations to try to approach a person and talk to them – I mean, David told you that incredible story – yesterday about that guy who was really about to kill him and he just looked and he called him friend, which came kind of spontaneously because David is a birthright Quaker. So that shows you long, long training helps in these situations. You know, when I think I told you when Nehru was getting beat up by Lathis, he, was, he looked up at that uh, cavalry, uh, that the mounted policeman and he said it would be so easy to pull that guy down off his horse. I'm a much better rider than he is. Uh, but then, as he said, long training and discipline held. Now that's one of my – I hope you kind of catch on. We're talking about two topics at once here. We're talking about the talk last night and about third-party nonviolent intervention. I'll try to keep it down to two simultaneous topics. Um, one of the questions that I didn't raise yesterday – I mean Tuesday when David was here – and the reason I didn't is that I raise it all the time. And I'm kind of famous for this. They, oh my God, here comes Nagler. Here we go again. I'm always sticking my hand up and saying, what about the training? Because to go to someone for a three-week training, that means, yes, you may know something about customs. You may know something about how to organize yourselves, how to keep track of one another, all of these good things. But when that deep button gets pushed and your sense of humanity is violated at a deep level, it's not going to be there for you. Uh, I, on one meeting in – took place in northern India. This was quite a while ago now. Narayan Desai was there. He was uh, – his father was Mahatma Gandhi's lifelong secretary, Mahadev Desai. And uh, they were going around the circle thinking of how we're going to build these Shanti Sena teams. And uh, how incidentally, I misspelled Shanti Sena. It's S-H-A-N-T-I. I, I left off the I on the blackboard. Tuesday, I noticed that to my horror, but didn't want to interrupt uh, David's presentation. Um, so, okay, we're going to do this Shanti Sena thing. How much training do we need? And the Americans who say, well, oh, I think an intensive weekend workshop would do it. <laughs> you know, we'll you, you use PowerPoint. Of course, they didn't say that. Uh, and the Indians, uh, when we were, and were a little more realistic, it was going to take 
I think we're going to have to dedicate two weeks to this. And they got around to Narayan and they said, what do we, they asked him, what do you think? Oh, I think one lifetime should be enough. So it really is one of the most uh, difficult and undeveloped questions in this whole field. Um, yeah? I think it should be much more addressed or much okay. more part of the, of the community because yeah. we are so trained and so easy to fall into. Mm -hmm. as, you know, when I go to a demonstration or something, it's yeah. so easy for me to just get so ready for it. And yep. Yep. Or yep. You know, and, and it's just so complex and yep. it needs a lot more attention. It, it needs a lot more attention. Ashley, did you want to add something? Oh, well, I was just saying to say, it's as said, it's almost like um, things sometimes that we teach require the ones who really uh -huh. know the tools, they know how to feel it in the process, and the ones who have the great intent to control it aren't yeah. the ones really giving the information like how to control it. Yeah. What, what we should probably do – I'm sorry, did I interrupt you, Ash? No, no. no okay. Uh, what we should probably do is when we come back to this, uh, when we're talking about globalization and what happened in Seattle, let's address the whole question of at least how to keep violence out of a demonstration, if not how to keep it out of your heart. Which, um, you know, act frankly, I was one of those uh, when they originally were organizing the Nonviolent Peace Force around 2001 and stuff. Uh, Mel Duncan, um, who is who's now sort of the CEO of this whole thing, he was saying, well, we should, we should offer meditation. And I was the one who said, let's not do it because you can't just pick somebody and say, okay, now you offer meditation. You know, you have to know how to do it. I've been doing it for 40 years and all I would do is show people the technique without getting involved in their karma. That's the most that I would dare to do on my, on my own. But it's a, it's a serious problem. I know you had a question, Roberto. We'll get to you in one second. Uh, paciencia todo lo alcanza. <laughs> uh, there's one way we've been able to go about this. It's not the greatest, but at least it works in a kind of rough and ready fashion. And that is not so much the training itself, but you, you use the training as a screening. And you try to get to know people and get to know if they've got what it takes to go and do stuff like this. And I remember hearing from Liam Mahoney, who was uh, one of the leaders of Peace Brigades International and was involved in the trainings for Haiti. Now, Haiti was a real success story because the UN got frightened and left because that's what, that's what the, the big institutions, that's what they do. They pull their people out immediately. United States Army fled. Yes, I said it and I'm glad. You know, when you see these signs <laughs> around rural areas that say, these colors don't run, red, white, and blue, guess what? They ran. <laughs> Whole ship full of uh, infantry, soldiers, or maybe it was Marines, I don't know, they pulled into Port-au-Prince and there was a few people on the dock saying, we've got pistols, we're going to shoot you. They turned, the ship turned around and went back. So the UN couldn't do it, the US Army couldn't do it, and this coalition called Cry for Justice in Haiti, which was like 75 people who had no weapons, practically no money, no nothing. They stayed there for months and months and months, protecting human lives while all of this was going on. But is this why I'm talking about Haiti? No. The reason I'm talking about it is that there was this rather long training for Cry for Justice. And at the very last minute, Liam had to say to somebody, you can't go. It's very, very difficult. But it's much better to do it then than to have somebody break down and you know, have to be carried out on a gurney or whatever. So you're saying which should be addressed more. And I'm very happy to hear you say that because this is what I do. That, you know, this is why they say, oh no, here comes Nagler. That, I'm constantly saying we have to pay much more attention to the training piece. Because if you realize how deep this is, I'm not sure how many of you have heard this story. I hope you'll be polite and pretend that you've never heard it before. But I had a friend who went down to San Francisco State uh, when there were some interracial problems there. And he, we recommended that he not go, but he went anyway. And then he, he called up and said, you know, hi, th this is Tim. So hi, Tim, what's up? 
Could someone come down and get me? <laughs> Where are you? It's the 63rd precinct. <laughs> what happened, Tim? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, he literally said, when I came to, I was sitting on the policeman's chest and hitting him. So, and this was a very pacific person, you know, because you'd never, if you asked him, he would say, you're never capable of doing such a thing. But you get there and these things erupt out of you. So this is a big, big problem. But the potential here also is very, very big because if we can tap into those deeper energies and get them on track, we have a really powerful force here. Okay, Roberto. Uh -huh. That once it gets so, uh, so bad to all those events, it's harder for yeah. them to be on part of the country. Uh -huh. It's not the people, it's the problem. Yeah. But the one thing that I've noticed from place that I've been as well, we also is mainly on how the protests are being conducted, how the leadership of the protests, the people are doing it. If they're doing targeting, let's say, the war on Iraq, or the Bush administration carrying yeah. out the war in Iraq. Because yeah. when I went to a place where they were talking about, let's pull out of the war, and not even talking about politics, the issue is let's get the troops out of there. People tend to focus on getting the troops instead of saying, yeah, Bush is not the yeah. smartest man, <laughs> so let's pull out. Yeah. Uh, if I could paraphrase your point for uh, the world. <laughs> Uh, what you're saying is very well taken, that one of the things that allows you to be nonpartisan is to not be ad hominem, as we say in the legal world. Not, it's not the person, it's the problem. And as you know, I think this is one of the two or three most basic principles in nonviolence. It's up there with means and the ends are the same. The person is not the problem. It, it's got to be like really, really basic principle. And yeah, these, there is, a p there is some value in reminding yourself. That the reminders do help. Now, from the earliest days, David was reminding me that there's a film called The Force More Powerful, a two-volume PBS series on nonviolent uprisings since Gandhi. These are really professional filmmakers. It makes our DVD look a little bit sick, but uh, these, these guys went and got some really amazing footage. And they have some footage of trainings in the civil rights movement. You know, it's grainy, black and white, cameras shaking around. But you see Jim Farmer walking people through what they call role plays. Now, I used to be very snobbish and think that role plays don't work. And then I was in one. And I was to play the part of somebody sitting on a s counter stool in one of those lunch counters. And then there were these people behind me who were making believe that they were rednecks. And guess what? I think those guys got a little out of hand. I think they actually believed it. <laughs> and I felt like I was in a certain amount of trouble, as a matter of fact. I mean, I was surrounded by Quakers. I knew nothing serious could happen to me. But um, what I want to say is that if you put yourself into a role even of acting out, even if the situation isn't real, the same emotions come up to some degree. And you can process those emotions. So then when you go into the scene and it happens in the real world, you it's just for the reality for you is the same. It's your emotions that you have to deal with. You know, this is a little bit like that finding that they discovered that it, when you see images of violence, the damage done by those images, it makes absolutely no difference whether you, think it w whether you think you're watching the news and this really happened or whether you think you're watching entertainment. Absolutely no difference. The violence is the same. The damage is the same. The only thing that m matters to the damage is deeper human relationships hurt more when you violate them. I mean, violations of like family bonds and things like that, you see those in entertainment, that's going to hurt more than perfect strangers. But it makes no difference that your conscious mind thinks or does not think that the thing is actually happening. It is actually happening for you. Yeah, Michael? What, what is, like how do you attack that then? Where does that come from? Uh, well, I think it comes from a violation of human unity. You, you see a family 
and you participate in the unity of that family, when that unity is torn apart, part of you is torn apart. You feel it in your own psyche. It's uh, we're getting into some deep philosophy here that I should save for this afternoon because I have to talk to a bunch of freshmen this afternoon about Stephen Hawking's book, um, a Brief History of Time. But not to not to uh, not to belittle the question, it is a very important one. I think uh, you know our whole thing here is predicated on the fact that uh, unity among human beings is a reality that we all are aware of. And in the last semester, we talked about some of the new scientific evidence that we actually do perceive one another's emotions on a very even in the in our own nervous system. So. Uh, in a way, that whole fabric of our beings, physiological, physical, physiological, mental, is ruptured. Now, okay, this is an important point because that means that the soldiers who are standing there getting the demonstration out of the way, they're hurting from what they're doing. So you can appeal to that. And that's a good way to get over the, the partisanship and hatred. So this is one of the key areas that we've uh, had to try to understand and develop in the world of third-party nonviolent intervention. Okay, what else did you pick up last night? Marisa, anything you'd like to share? Um, well, you touched on this a bit, that mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. After all is said and done, this is satyagraha we're talking about. We're clinging to truth, so you should be able to do most everything that you do openly. You remember that there are some times when you do have to finesse this where doing something openly doesn't necessarily refer to the facts of the situation. We talked about a German Catholic priest who was hiding people and he lied about it to the Gestapo and he was challenged later on, why did you lie? <laughs> That's a sin. <laughs> and he said the whole system was a lie. You know, it didn't make any sense saying something that was factually correct in a system like that. But that finesse aside, I think Muhammad spoke to that very well, that they have truth and justice is on their side. Or I would go even further and say, if you believe truth and justice is on your side and you're willing to test it, that's enough. Because if you say, the truth is on my side, you're on your way to being uh, an, an untruthful, an ideological person. But if you say, I am fully confident that the truth is on our side, and I'm willing to change my mind if you convince me otherwise. But as until you've done that, I'm, I believe the truth is on my side and therefore I have nothing to hide. And that gives a person a certain kind of power and a movement a certain kind of power. Yeah, he was very good on that point. Okay. Um, other things, John, anything that you? Okay, that happens to me too. Oh, was that a cat he was talking about? Yeah. yeah. Oh, he was, you know, he answered that question wrong, I think. Someone in the audience who is obviously a Zionist and was taking copious notes challenged Muhammad by saying that yesterday in Lebanon, some Hamas terrorists slit somebody's throat off in the forest. And now you're telling us that you're nonviolent. Now, what I would have said. <laughs> Incidentally, Muhammad said he wants to come here and do an MA. So that's going to be pretty cool. But what I would have said was, I said we were nonviolent. I didn't say that every Arab in the world was nonviolent. Uh, I can – okay, let's – off the top of my head. Ted Bundy, the serial killer. I mean, I happen to know about this guy because he read my book 
when he was getting ready to be executed and we were actually corresponding for a while. Boy, that was hairy. Mm -hmm. uh, I almost <laughs> became Sister Helen Prejean there for a minute. But okay, here's Ted Bundy. He killed, I don't know, 21 nurses or something like that. Does that mean that all Americans are serial killers? See, this is how prejudice works. You take the worst example of a group and you, you characterize the whole group by that example. But their English is you know, not so great. He didn't quite understand it. And what he said was if, you, uh, if the Israelis had come here and treated us as uh, – come here as guests, we would have welcomed them, given them water, asked about their kids, all the rest of it. They came here and reduced us to you know, the state of, where we don't even have water, literally. Uh, obviously, you get angry and you fight back. What do you expect? That was the point he was making. Okay. Any, did you notice anything that – you could remind me of your name? I'm Emily. Emily, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I just in general was struck by how, how much energy there was. Whoa. Was that was amazing. Yeah. It was just astounding to me because there was so much energy and tension in that one room. And yeah. In the two hours that we were there. Yeah. And Yes. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Emily's uh, point is extremely well taken. That in the case of both of these individuals, Feryal and Muhammad. The passion, the energy, and it's particularly I would say in her case. Now, in her case, I haven't talked about her as much because I don't think they had any really developed nonviolent resistance to speak of. Uh, and God knows it would be horrendously difficult to do it. But when she said nonviolence, all she meant was they weren't th hitting back. So that's non-violence. So I had that's why I didn't talk about her as much, but the power of that woman, my God. I know that, that, and as you say, to live in that kind of tension. I mean, we, we had a hard time. I was glad I had a long bike ride afterwards. <laughs> we had a hard time in two hours. Can you imagine? They've been living through this for 59 years. The people have been born under this kind of tension. So the fact that they're being nonviolent at all is amazing. It's just – it's a testament to the human spirit. Let's see. Shannon, were you there? I didn't notice you. Okay. No, that's okay. It's just sometimes with that new hat style you're wearing, I can't. <laughs> okay. Amy? I thought you said that the job of answering like, I think it was the last question, was there yes. a anything? Yes. Is, um, <laughs> the example of some of the, um, the mm -hmm. former Israeli soldiers yeah. who were participating in the demonstration and the Yeah. And I thought that yeah. was really interesting. That was a good one. Someone asked, is there a cure for Zion? In incidentally, the audience was much harder to handle than the presenters. It just shows you when you sit here thinking about all of that, you get so angry that you can't – you're basically useless. The people who are actually having – getting shot – I mean, Muhammad is hit by these three salt bullets. He showed the wounds on his back in the film. The people actually in there doing it and getting shot at, somehow they rise above it and manage their emotions more successfully. So someone asked, is there a cure for Zionism? And the attention – the intent being – to infuriate that gentleman in the front row. Uh, Muhammad said uh, – he, he literally said – I mean, for coming from him who doesn't know English that well, it wasn't as corny as if one of us said it. He said, one of my best friends is an Israeli. <laughs> there was a man who had been in the IDF. He had been in the Army and he knew that. But he came to the demonstrations and he talked about somebody else coming to the demonstration holding the hand of an Israeli. Key point – I mean, the, way back in the first intifada, that was one of the things that Mubarak insisted on. He said there's going to be no, no cursing, no stone throwing, and Jews and Arabs are going to do this together. That was his three conditions from the very get-go. And uh, they did do it together. They found it very difficult to eat together, interestingly enough. They could go out and get arrested together, get killed together, sit down at the same table and eat together. It was a little hard, but he insisted that they do that. So yes, he answered that question very well. And there was another question that he answered I think even better, which is again was a hostile question and the audience was trying to save him 
from the question by shouting this guy down. And he said, look, if I can talk to an IDF soldier who is pointing a machine gun at me, I should be able to talk to this guy <laughs> in the front row and answer his question. And he was really much more into dialogue and education and raising consciousness than the people in the audience were. Yeah, Marisa. Yes. Yes, that's right. Calm down, everyone. Yeah. 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 He, you could almost see him the w being on a, at a demonstration, the, telling the Shabab not to throw stones and telling the Israelis not to shoot. Yeah. Okay, Emily. Oh my gosh. He hit the guy who was there from the International Patrol of Aiden on it. Whoa. Um, so I just found that during my ironic very nonviolent talk and also yeah. like very well, very symbolic. Yeah, he was the one who accused uh, Muhammad of not being truthful when he said the Palestinians were nonviolent and then he goes out and punches somebody in a public meeting. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Incidentally, I don't know if you noticed in the paper yesterday, I hope you didn't. You don't read it anymore, I hope, but uh, there was an article. Uh, uh, surveys were conducted in America and in certain Islamic countries. Survey the general public and ask them, how many of you – would you accept bombing of civilians under extreme circumstances? And I think seven – roughly speaking, 76 percent of Americans surveyed said they would and something like 51 percent of Muslims said they would. Just, just keep that in the back of your mind next time some of these stereotypes come up. Yeah. So, okay, I, I think that was an extremely useful um, event. I, I, was, I was really thrilled and encouraged to see what they're trying to do. But I have to say these people are almost up there with Tibet uh, in the sense that this is nonviolence under the probably the most difficult circumstances imaginable. I remember when Sami Awad was here a few years ago saying that uh, you – how are you going to ha organize a nonviolent demonstration when you don't even have a telephone, when they've shut down your phone lines? And in fact, there have been some ama amazing cases of spontaneous self-organization, mostly by women who had to go out and shop for groceries and violated curfews. And the next thing they know, everybody in the street has – you know, everyone on the block has turned out with them. Jenna, did you have anything to add? Um, I was really impressed with the KCB thing. Yes, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, like, it actually like, came from like a, you know, like all the budget campaigns and the campaign. No, I haven't read that novel, yeah. Um, it's a, it's just a Palestinian writer, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, to paraphrase that just really quickly and, and without your skill with images. Uh, they, it's, they've been very uh, creative in, in their attempts in the demonstrations and not without a sense of humor. And one thing that they have uh, attempted to demonstrate is the silence of the international community. And there's one slide where they had people dressed up in different uh, costumes representing different countries where they had, you know, American flag, German flag, French flag, and everybody had their lips X'd out with tape. So that's probably one of the things that hurts them most is the paralysis of the international community. And, you know, we might want to ask ourselves why that is happening. And, but that does mean that when internationals go there, it makes a huge, a huge difference to them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a, a very useful strategy has been surprise, disconcerting. Um, IDF units will get there and there will be a demonstration and they won't anticipate it. They won't know how to handle it exactly. All they know how to do is bark out orders. And normally they're not terribly creative beyond that. Though I, to give them their due, I must say I had a physical one time many years ago because I had signed up to be a CO and they were desperately trying to figure out something else for me. So they hoped that I had something physically wrong with me so they wouldn't have to give me my CO. Anyway, this is to explain what I was doing in an Army induction center uh, getting a physical. And the guy in front of me online, we were about to give a blood sample, and, and he said, I'm going to faint. And I said, why? He said, I faint every time I see blood. So <laughs> sure enough, they took a little blood out of his arm and went <laughs> <laughs> and he landed flat on his back with his eyes wide open. He was conscious but absolutely paralyzed. And uh, so clearly this is not prime material for the Army, right? <laughs> but the, it was embarrassing the whole unit. And the, the sergeant came over and said, get up, you. <laughs> Which, of course, these guys paralyzed. And so we're all we're start, we're starting to titter. And finally he said, all right, lie there. <laughs> 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 so these poor guys who are in, have to carry out these orders, they – they're not given the tools that they need to deal with this very creatively. But I would like actually – and thank you, Jenna, for reminding me – I would like actually to talk about what it is they are doing. They, they go down – for example, one of the really, really tragic things that's happening is the uprooting of olive trees. This is like tearing the heart out of a Palestinian. An olive tree is to a Palestinian what a cow is to an Indian. You know, this is – Mother Nature, our source of livelihood. This is where they respect life. And here it is being wrenched out by these horrific machines. And they go and you saw a guy chaining himself to an olive tree. Uh, and then what happens? The IDF comes in and they take bolt cutters and cut him off, cut the chain and lead him away. And so I did want to talk strategically about what they're trying to do because they have gone down there and delayed the construct – oh, rats. They've gone down there and delayed the construction of the wall, but they haven't stopped it yet. And let's do some strategic thinking for them, which we – I mean, we are in touch with them. This, this might be real – as to what could possibly be done to carry it further. They showed a picture of somebody who would put himself in a contraption which looked like a crucifix, actually, and he was – uh, kind of staked into the ground. So he was lying in the way of the bulldozers and they couldn't get him out. And they learned these techniques from what people have done in Earth first here in this country and so forth. So the IDF comes and they see him and, you know, it took them about five minutes to figure out how to get him unpinned and arrest him and lead it away. So they need to go somewhere. They need to get take this to a different step. Let's do – so on Tuesday, we'll do what I said we were going to do today. We just talk a little bit more about third-party nonviolent intervention and then restorative justice. Hmm?